Okay, welcome to this talk. Uh, the work that I will be presenting uh, is a collaborative work that I've been doing together with uh, a philosopher, Patricia Rich, at the University of Beirut, and uh, two computer scientists, Ron Altaham and uh, Todd Warren. And the question that I will be asking myself in this talk is, uh, is this one. How hard is cognitive science? So how hard do you think cognitive science is? I think few people would say uh, cognitive science is easy. Probably you're into it. Cognitive science is hard. Well, maybe science in general is hard. Uh, but why? If it's indeed hard, what makes it so? And I think here people may have different intuitions and there could be several reasons why cognitive science or science in general is hard. But I think one reason that will come to mind to many is uncertainty. In cognitive science and science in general, we have to deal with lots of uncertainty. And that makes science and cognitive science hard. And there's different kinds of uncertainty. So uh, for instance, I think most commonly thought of is the uncertainty in the statistical inferences uh, that we make as scientists. So for instance, when, uh, when we observe or collect data, there is, there's error, there's noise in our data, uh, there's measurement error. And when we want to draw some inferences about which effects actually are present or absent, uh, there is a whole um, machinery, statistical machinery and tools in place to support such statistical inferences. And uh, well, we need them because statistical inference is hard. But this is only one dimension of uncertainty. Another dimension of uncertainty is how do we generalize from our observations? So even setting aside uh, the uncertainty in what, what can we statistically infer from our current data? How, do, how can we generalize our inferences to new situations? Um, for instance, if we run an experiment again, uh, under what conditions should we expect uh, this, to find the same effect or different effects? And uh, well, for people with a more philosophical background, maybe Goodman's riddle of induction comes to mind. If we observe a green emerald, how do we know the emerald isn't grew and that there is some point in time where it actually turns blue? How can we actually make inferences about future observations based on past observations? And um, to make matters even worse in terms of uncertainty, we also have a problem of uh, underdetermination of theory by data. Uh, in the sense that uh, if we have observations, there's always multiple, in principle, maybe even infinitely many, different theories that are consistent with the data. Uh, so we cannot, based on observations alone, deduce which theory about how things work, what produced the data, uh, is the case. And there is fundamental underdetermination. So if you imagine all this uncertainty is gone, what do you intuit? Is then sort of the life of scientists easy? Well, maybe not because there's people around. And, but I mean, specifically the scientific inferences that the scientist uh, needs to make. Are they easy if all uncertainty of this kind is removed? And um, well, this is, this is a question. This is the question that we, we set out to address and maybe think about it for a sec, what your own intuition is about this. Okay, so to address this question, we proceeded as follows. We, we um, imagined a fictive scenario, uh, and here you will meet our fictive corporate scientist. There they are, and, and they have a name. They're called Dr. Conjecture. And this fictive uh, scientist is in a, a basically an ideal situation in the sense that they have no uncertainty. They are trying to, they want to understand the workings or explain the workings of some cognitive mechanism. We're assuming this is a cognitive uh, 
scientist, but they have no uncertainty in the sense that their observations are error-free. All the observations they have are, are correct. There's no error in them. And also all the observations that they have are relevant, in fact, for whatever they want to explain. Um, also, they, uh, they only need to come up with an explanation that's just consistent with the data. And let's grant them that it will generalize and also that there is no problem of induction in the sense that maybe there's only one theory that's consistent with the data. Or if there's multiple, we're not going to care about any of the differences. Any one of them would be good, right? So, so we assume that uh, this is an ideal setting without any uncertainty. And our effective cognitive scientist wants to come up with explanations of any such cognitive mechanism and uh, can do so by postulating two kinds of explanations, a functional or an algorithmic one. And the function merely stipulates a candidate function that uh, is consistent with the observations of situations uh, and behaviors in different situations. Now, the cognitive scientist uh, can also come up with an algorithm explaining this uh, mechanism. This would go beyond simply describing the mapping from situations to behaviors, but actually give a possible account of the process and the mechanism characterized by an algorithm uh, that transforms the situations into the behaviors. Now, in order to analyze how hard the inference problems are that Dr. Conjecture faces, we wanted to make formal models of these inference problems. And, uh, and these are a form of abduction in the sense they generate explanations. They're not a form of deduction, um, but uh, yeah, this, is, this is also known as abduction when you generate a possible explanation for your observations. Now, to make a formally precise model, we need several ingredients. And the list is not short, so please bear with me, but I'll walk you uh, through it. OK, so first of all, of course, we have this mechanism M, right? And this is the mechanism that the scientist uh, wants to explain. Uh, and this uh, scientist also has data available. And this data is, you can uh, see here an example, it's just a fictive example of basically a big lookup table where there is listed some situations and for a situation an observed behavior, right? So the, the scientist can has a potentially very long list of observations of situations and behaviors that the system displayed in those situations, right? So maybe in experimental psychology language, you would say these, these are different uh, conditions and uh, different behaviors in those conditions. Now, these behaviors, they can be anything. They can be uh, actions or choices or percepts or reaction time or some combination of these. It doesn't matter. Now, this is a very high level of abstraction, this model. When a scientist is making uh, an abductive inference, generating explanations, they also bring presumably background knowledge to the task. And uh, we formalize this by postulating that the scientist has in mind already a priori a certain class of functions or a certain class of algorithms that satisfy their background assumptions about what kind of thing this M is. Yeah, so they already have some idea about that M belongs to a particular class. So for instance, um, say you're a decision theorist and then uh, you think M is a decision procedure that maximizes utility. This is your background assumption. Now, the background assumption may, of course, be false. So possibly um, uh, a, com uh, a competing theorist says, no, this is all false. Instead, M is a toolbox of fast and frugal heuristics, because I think uh, this is the kind of decision-making machinery that we have. Yeah? So with our formalization, we want to capture any and all of such background assumptions. So different scientists may pr bring different background assumptions to the task. Uh, but the important point is that all of them bring some such background assumptions. Uh, the list continues of ingredients that we need. 
So this scientist is trying to come up with functions and algorithms, um, but also needs some language to describe them. But this is important because we as scientists need to, we, we can have an idea, but we need to be able to describe it uh, in a way that we can also uh, tell other scientists our ideas, right? So, so we need some language, or this figure scientist needs some language to describe their hypothesized functions or hypothesized algorithms. And we say, uh, this is our symbol, this uh, L, of, uh, L sub F is the language for functional explanations. And there is also the language for algorithmic explanations, right? So these, these languages allow you to express in some form, um, and that can be natural language, formal notation, or some mix of the two, also some sketches, uh, anything that in some way encodes the information about what the function is that the scientist um, has hypothesized or uh, what algorithm they have um, hypothesized. In addition, presumably there's some bound on the length of this description that they're making. Uh, because our explanations as scientists, they, they need to fit on the pages of the papers or books we write. Yeah? If, if I have only 30 pages, say, or maybe I have 100 in a book, I don't know. Uh, whatever explanation I come up, it must fit in that space. If it's bigger, then I just cannot express it in that space. Yeah? Um, and presumably, we would require of good explanations that they, that they have some bounded length. Uh, if they have infinite length, I would think that we don't consider them uh, good explanations because we wouldn't even be able to communicate them uh, to anybody else. Maybe we wouldn't even be able to grasp them ourselves. Okay, so these are the ingredients. And with these ingredients together, we could uh, formalize uh, the two kinds of um, scientific inference problems. So when Dr. Conjecture is coming up with a functional explanation, what this, this model of the, the inference problem that they are uh, are solving uh, assumes is that they are given a set of data yeah, of observed situation behavior pairs. They have it available. And as I said before, it's perfect data. Now this data is generated by some unknown function, right? Because oh, it was generated by M, but uh, Dr. Conjecture doesn't know what function M is computing because this is actually what uh, the scientist is trying to, to come up with as an explanation. But they bring background knowledge, background assumption that whatever function it is, it's gonna be of this type, a type um, F, yeah? So it's, it belongs to a particular class of functions. Also, there's gonna be some upper bounds on the length of the description that is given. So, the, so what the scientist produces is this description, and that description is to be of a certain maximum length k. Now we included uh, infinite as a possible case, just to see what happens if you actually allow for this. And you will see, I will come back to it in our results. Okay, so what the scientist produces is a description of this function such that the function that they uh, postulate as a possible explanation is consistent with the data. Uh, now, one may ask, what do we mean by consistent with the data? Uh, well, we mean um, that if you were to give from the data set a situation as input to this function, then the output produced by this function will be in your opposite served set of possible behaviors for this situation. Yeah, that's, that's just what we mean with consistent. So basically it fits, fits the data. Now this exact, so we will be working with this definition, but the exact definition as it turns out doesn't matter so much. And I'll say more about that later. Uh, okay, so the scientists will produce such an explanation if it exists. And if there doesn't exist one, uh, for instance, because there isn't any one that can be described with the language that the scientist has that fits actually uh, the number of pages or the word count, or the, the maximum word count that we have, then it would be nice if the scientist would be able to know 
that none such exist. Yeah, okay, so this is now a characterization of the uh, scientific inference problem that is solved by this fictive scientist. And in a completely analogous way, we also have an algorithmic uh, variant of the same inference problem, right? And there, instead of um, producing an explanation in terms of a function, uh, the scientist produces an explanation in terms of an algorithm describing the process by which uh, the function that, that is consistent with the observations uh, is computed, or at least according to their possible explanation. So what we wanted to now know is we have precisely defined these uh, scientific inference problems. And uh, we asked ourselves the question again, so well, how hard are they? Yeah. And uh, to analyze this, we used uh, a mathematical proof technique from uh, computational complexity theory. And I cannot, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, this go into the nitty gritty details of this technique. But if you're interested in also learning how to apply the technique, then I warmly recommend our textbook where you can actually learn to, uh, to use this technique for your own complexity analysis. For purposes of this talk, I think it suffices to give you a conceptual feel for how the technique works. And uh, I'll illustrate it with this, uh, with this example here. So on the left, uh, you see a sketch of a possible uh, problem that, well, maybe you, you may face. Uh, I face it too. A scheduling problem. Yeah. And uh, so this is a problem. You have lots of stuff to do and you have to somehow schedule it. Uh, such that you don't, so you need to, uh, you have meetings on your work, you have to prepare maybe a lecture or a talk, uh, you have some groceries to do to pick up your kids. Um, you need to schedule this all in the week, and uh, you need to prevent scheduling conflicts. This can be particularly challenging if you also need to coordinate this with meetings with other people who also have uh, scheduling constraints. So this problem could be quite, uh, quite tough. Now imagine that you would be able to transform your problem, your scheduling problem, into a different problem. This lovely coloring problem that uh, a kit would solve. Um, Maybe familiar to some of you if you have some uh, scribbles like this. Uh, you could have a puzzle. You're given these scribbles, and, and the solution is a coloring of the areas. Um, um, what is it, created by these scribbles in such a way that two neighboring areas uh, are not allowed to have the same color. Yeah? So some kids, uh, I as a kid used to, used to do this. It was fun. Now imagine that you could basically uh, embed or translate your scheduling problem, transform that into a scribble like this, such that you could give that maybe to your seven-year-old, and they would solve, would solve it, and you would be able to easily read off the solution such that that would solve your scheduling problem. Yeah? So, so imagine that that was possible. And these arrows here, that's what we call a reduction. Uh, now, in fact, we know that it's possible to actually have such a reduction, such a transformation. Uh, from, a ske from scheduling to coloring. We, we know it exists, it's not just dictated. Now, let's say you would know that the scheduling problem is hard. And um, here's one notion of hard, uh, and one notion of hardness that we care about is uncomputability. And, and uncomputable means there is no algorithm that for any given, um, instance of the scheduling problem will give you actually a solution. Yeah? So, so if that is the case for some problem, uh, then we say the problem is uncomputable. Now, if there were such a reduction, like here's such a transformation, and say your problem one, in this case scheduling, were uncomputable, there's no algorithm, note that then there also could not be an algorithm for the coloring problem. Then also the coloring problem had to be uncomputable. 
I don't know if it's obvious why that, that is the case, but uh, you can argue by contradiction. Let's assume that the coloring problem did have an algorithm for its solution, while the scattering problem does not, well, then we would have a contradiction because we would have an easy transformation. So we would have an algorithm actually for solving scheduling, namely via this indirect route of solving the coloring problem and then reading off the solution. Yeah. So if, if our problem one, in our example, this is uh, scheduling is uncomputable and such a reduction, which are these arrows exist, then also our problem two must be uncomputable. Yeah? And this kind of reduction we can use to show new problems for which we don't know yet how hard they are, for instance, like the scientific inference problems. We can show, with, for instance, that they're hard by taking known hard problems and proving the existence of such a reduction. Okay, now this is a very special kind of hardness, namely, uh, if a problem is uncomputable, then there exists no algorithm whatsoever that can solve it. Now, for most problems, uh, most problems aren't actually this hard. Uh, and in fact, both scheduling and coloring aren't this hard. They, they do have algorithms to solve them, but these algorithms are so-called uh, intractable. Uh, what do we mean by this is that, well, the algorithm their algorithms exist, but all the algorithms for solving these problems consume an enormous amount of computational resources. In fact, an exponential amount of resources. And why is this an issue? Well, this is illustrated here uh, by this slide as a, as a um, brief intermezzo. I'll go back to the reduction in a moment. So this slide shows a uh, running time for two kinds of algorithms. The one on the left, we call a polynomial time algorithm. In fact, it's quadratic. Um, any algorithm which, uh, which has a running time that is uh, polynomial in the input size, which is N here. And so for instance, the input size for the scientific inference problem is say the data set. And, uh, any running time that's n to some constant, we say that's polynomial. We also say it's tractable. However, some problems are so hard, they're intractable, that they have no algorithm of this type. Uh, they can't exist. Uh, all algorithms for solving them require more than polynomial time. For instance, they require exponential time, like shown here on the right. And you see that for relatively small inputs, say n is five, the two different kinds of algorithms, the, the running time don't uh, differ that much. But as soon as the input size becomes medium to large, already the two algorithms start to diverge. And especially for a larger n, uh, the amount of time consumed by an exponential time algorithm just becomes astronomical. And I don't know uh, how good your intuitions are about the size of this last number here for n is, um, n is a thousand, though in fact, I, I know that intuition about exponential sizes is very difficult, difficult for most people, even for very trained people. But just to give you an idea of the sheer number or the sheer size of this number uh, of 10 to the 288. Yeah, so how big is that? How long is that? Well, as a comparison, take, uh, consider that the number of atoms in the universe is about uh, 10 to the 81. And the number of seconds since the birth of the universe is estimated to be about 10 to the 27 or 28. So that means if in our brain, there were as many parallel channels as there are atoms in the universe, it would take us longer than the time that has passed since the birth of the universe to actually complete a computation of this uh, order of magnitude of running time. Yeah, okay, so for this reason, uh, exponential running times are considered intractable for any but very small inputs. Okay, 
So back to our uh, example. So in fact, it is known that uh, scheduling is intractable in this sense. Yeah, in that uh, bearing some uh, mathematical background uh, conjectures, there exists no uh, tractable algorithm, no polynomial time algorithm for solving the scheduling uh, problem. It's also known, as I said before, that there exists such a reduction from scheduling to coloring. So that also means that coloring is hard uh, in this sense, uh, that uh, because scheduling is intractable, also coloring must be intractable because, again, by contradiction, if it weren't, then we would have a tractable procedure via this reduction for solving scheduling, which would contradict the intractability of scheduling. Yeah? So this is just to illustrate to you with, I hope, an intuitive example, how this technique of reduction works. Yeah? And we use this mathematical proof technique to actually analyze the computational complexity of the two scientific inference problems that I, I showed before. And if you want to read the proofs in detail, uh, check out um, the supplementary materials in our paper, and I will also uh, add a reference to the paper at the end of this talk. So using this proof technique, we derived some results. And here's an overview of our results in this table. So this table is directly from our uh, paper. Uh, so what are the results? How hard is cognitive science? Well, note that there are some assumptions here. Um, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, this additional assumption that L, uh, LF, this language that the scientist uh, conjecture is using to express functions and and also the language to express algorithms that are tractable. That is just a background assumption, basically that in order to interpret their own description, uh, that itself should, should also be tractable. Yeah? So we grant it, basically grant uh, the language is such that uh, the scientists can understand their own explanations and, and also other scientists can. Yeah? Uh, we also considered the two cases I mentioned it before, but there, where there is no upper bound on the length of the uh, description that they come up with there on, on the length of the description of the explanation, or there is one, right? So these are the, the two conditions that we, that we considered. And uh, they matter in the sense that if there is no upper bound on the length, then actually uh, neither coming up with functional explanations or algorithmic explanations for doctor conjecture under these ideal conditions uh, is, is even computable. If we assume that the system that Dr. Conjecture wants to explain the workings of has an explanation that fits in the number of words that we want to express our explanation, then uh, there is an algorithm in principle to come up with such explanations or know that none exists. This is um, because you basically run out of space. But still, there is no tractable algorithm to do this. So there's no tractable algorithm that given perfect data and background assumptions about what class of functions or class of algorithms uh, describe the mechani mechanism's behavior uh, that will produce, will be able to produce an explanation consistent with the data. Huh? Um, Maybe an interesting additional observation here. Uh, I didn't say yet how we prove it. It's actually, we don't do that with, with the technique of reduction, but again, check our supplementary materials if you're, or if you're interested to know how we prove it. But we do know that if there is a bound on the description length, and we were to say accidentally hit upon a good explanation, uh, we would be able to verify that it indeed fits the data, right? So these are two different things. So, so there's no algorithm that given the data will tractably generate an explanation that fits the data. But if you were to be given such an explanation, you would be able to tractably verify that indeed that explanation fits the data. Okay, so these are the results uh, from a computational complexity perspective. So the upshot of this is that, well, even if we have perfect data, 
we have no problem of induction and no other determination of theory by data, still there cannot exist any tractable procedure for generating explanatory theories. Or as I also like to put it, cognitive science is so hard that it cannot be automated. Okay, so this is, I think, at least one of the main take homes. And I'll get to some more take homes in a moment. Before I do, I uh, want to address some possible objections because I can imagine that as you have been listening to me, that maybe in your head, there's lots of yes buts or maybe as uh, one reviewer also wrote to us one time, well, this is all just wrong. This all just sounds wrong somehow. And I don't, I'm not buying your conclusions because I think some mistaken inference or assumption is, somewhere, uh, is made somewhere along the way. So let us uh, discuss some such objections um, right on. Okay, so here's one. Here's one possible objection. So one possible objection that you may have or someone else is, yeah, but the situation as you modeled it, it's far too idealized. Cognitive science is much more messy than this. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's too ideal. It's too perfect. And uh, I'm not buying your results. Right? So one may object like this. Uh, yeah, one, one reason for why it's too perfect, it's not just because, uh, I don't know, there's no messy desk with all kinds of papers. No, there's also all this uncertainty is squeezed out. You have this completely idealized situation and all the uncertainty is out and it's just, it's, it's too perfect. Okay, so what, what could be a possible response to such an objection is, well, you're right, it is idealized and it is too perfect. But what we show is that even if we idealize to this extent that all the mess is out, uh, still cognitive science is hard. And putting the mess back in can't make it easier. It can only make it even harder, right? So that would be my response to, to such an objection. Now maybe not satisfied and say, yeah, but yeah, too quick. Uh, I'm not convinced yet. You are right. One may argue you are right that uncertainty can only make it um, harder, but there is a different aspect of the idealization, which makes me not buying your results. Namely, you're assuming that the explanation needs to be perfect. It needs to perfectly fit with all the data, and uh, we don't require this in real um, cognitive science practice. Yeah. Okay, so that's a, it's a fair objection. Uh, to answer it, I would uh, note that we consider, we also consider this possible objection. And uh, what we actually found is that this consistency, as I defined it to be consistent with, with the whole data set, is not a requirement for the intractability result. Uh, in fact, if we say the explana uh, explanation need only be uh, consistent with, say, at least half of the data. So, so you can scratch out some data. You, you can pick even which ones, which ones you want to scratch out. You could even make it dependent on your explanation, which ones you want to scratch out, maybe some uh, harking after the fact. All fine. Um, still, we can show that a reduction still exists. And so the intractability that we prove isn't uh, dependent on a perfect fit. Even if you say some more than half fit, that is also intractable to find. There's no algorithm that will guarantee you to get an explanation that will fit, say, at least half of your data. Yeah, okay, so that will be an answer to that possible objection. Now, okay, so a follow-up objection can be, Okay, okay, fair. That's actually quite uh, counterintuitive because maybe you would think you know, only explaining half of the data should be easy, but okay. 
uh, so maybe you feel there's still something wrong here, right? So uh, I, we are making a wrong assumption about how scientists go about um, coming up with their explanations. So one may object, yeah, but scientists aren't randomly searching these explanations. They bring background knowledge. They already have some a priori ideas about the kind of thing that M is, right? So, so it's not that of all the possible functions, they don't need to go, they only need to consider functions of a certain type. And so they're not randomly searching the whole space. Okay, also fair. So we would say, well, that's already captured in our formal definition of the scientific inference uh, problems. Namely, as you may recall, we already specified that the scientists brings with them a priori hypotheses about what kind of mechanism M is and how that constrains actually the space of possible functions that they even need to consider or the space of possible algorithms. So all functions and algorithms that aren't part of this class constrained by their a priori uh, assumptions, uh, the scientist doesn't need to consider. And, uh, and we also in our proofs explored different cognitively relevant interpretations of these classes. So for instance, we considered, yeah, what, what if the scientist assumes that the cognitive architecture is like an act arc architecture, or if, it's, if it can be characterized with neural networks, either feed forward or recurrent, or if they assume it's some reactive architecture such as used in, in robotics, or maybe it's a fast and frugal uh, set of fast and frugal heuristics, right? So, such as um, proposed by some decision-making researchers. Our results hold for any and all of them, right? So it's not that the intractability comes from the fact that we assume sort of an absence of constraints on the space of possible functions. Now we can impose strong cognitively relevant constraints on the class of functions and algorithms Still, there is no tractable algorithm that generates from perfect data uh, good explanations. Yeah, okay. So, objection four. Okay, okay. Maybe you think, okay, there cannot be maybe one algorithm that does the full trick. But what if we have a set of them? And maybe uh, different researchers pursue a different set, or maybe we have uh, a way of deciding which algorithm to use when. That is also a possible objection, right? Say, so, okay, you maybe, Iris, you showed, you argued if you believe the proofs, uh, that there is no single uh, algorithm, but maybe there can be a set of them. And, uh, and then we can still automate science because we have a set and we just pick from this this set. Okay. That is a possible objection, but it won't, won't work. Because realize that if you have at least a fixed set of algorithms, a, a fixed set, a constant size set of algorithms is itself also an algorithm. And uh, we prove proven none such can exist. Now, it could be, of course, that you have an unbounded set. That is possible, but that's not an algorithm. Um, if you say, I have infinitely many uh, procedures, okay, uh, but that's not an algorithm, right? And also we don't have actually infinitely many uh, scientists, but if we were, if we would have infinitely many scientists and each of them would pursue a different procedure, that's fine. Uh, that's not a problem, uh, but that wouldn't instantiate automation. And the important point here is that that pluralism and this indeterminacy in a sense about, yeah, well, okay, there can be different procedures, but there's no fixed way of deciding uh, which procedure to use when, because that would actually instantiate an algorithm. Uh, so this pluralism and its indeterminacy is, I would argue, necessary for discovery. That is an implication as I interpret our results. Okay, so 
Maybe you think raising all these objections, Iris come back with all kinds of <laughs> answers. Is she now saying it's all hopeless? Right, so, okay, so, so what can we do? Uh, maybe you feel that if there's no algorithm, then it's all hopeless because then how can we in a systematic way from our observations uh, come up with explanations? Uh, and I would say, no, yeah, well, there's no, there's no reason to think that corporate science is hopeless. It's interesting in a sense if, if, if this kind of result would generate such a sentiment because we already had all these problems from uh, uncertainty. And uh, certainly it's not the case that the problem of induction is solved. And certainly it's not the case that the problem of underdetermination of theory by data is solved. And we don't consider those uh, fundamental problems in scientific inference as making our science hopeless. I mean, we still do cognitive science. So now discovering that there is further hardness that maybe, uh, maybe you had not realized it's not a reason to stop doing corporate science. Of course, we can still do corporate science. Uh, it just need to take the implications of the results seriously. Uh, also, uh, as I noted in this table, there is a silver lining that possibly if we were to hit upon quick explanations for some corporate systems, uh, likely we would be able to recognize them as good explanations. Um, so in that sense, it's also not hopeless. It's just that we cannot expect to have a simple procedure, um, automated way, or um, uh, a way of codifying uh, our inferences such that, um, yeah, that we basically can um, go from data in a way, basically deduce in a tractable way um, explanations for the systems we want to explain and understand. I could, of course, go on with objections, but I won't. I will leave you uh, opportunity to raise some during the discussion um, uh, period. And I'm very much looking forward to, uh, if, if I even convinced you with my answers to these objections, or if you come up with some new ones that I haven't considered yet, I would really love to hear that. Uh, but let me then close with, um, well, some of the conclusions and take home messages I think, from this, uh, this work and these analysis. So first of all, Conclusion is that, well, yeah, cognitive science is really hard. Now, nobody is surprised by this. You already probably thought cognitive science is uh, hard. Um, but what the analysis show is that even without the usual suspects of what you may think make cognitive science hard, such as statistical error, problems of induction, or underdetermination of theory by data, even if we um, take them out of the equation, still cognitive science uh, is hard in the sense that there is hidden complexity, computational complexity, not uncertainty, when we want to infer explanations from our observations. Now, why is this important to be aware of this? Uh, there's different reasons possibly why it's important, but here's one. Uh, one that is also uh, close to my heart, namely that, as some of you may be aware, there's lots of methodological reform going on and in general uh, methods development that is trying to address issues of uncertainty. And what I hope to um, convey is that these recommendations for how to possibly cope with issues of uncertainty of the different types, though most of the time this focuses on um, uncertainty in our statistical inferences, they leave this problem of complexity completely untouched. Or worse even, the recommendations for how to cope with uh, uncertainty, for instance, by codifying uh, scientific inferences in rules may make matters worse uh, rather than better. Yeah? Uh, because they are not uh, tuned into uh, the complexity 
of, of, of scientific inference. So what I would argue is that we need a more holistic perspective of scientific inference than the one that is, I think, uh, currently dominant in methodological reform. And I don't mean to say that this idealized scenario that I presented gives this full holistic perspective, far from it, of course. But I think the analysis shows that if you dig deeper, you can uncover problems of scientific inference, problems in corporate science that would otherwise be hidden or invisible. And, and, and I've uncovered here one, namely the computational complexity of um, abductive inference coming up with explanations. Now, if we take a more holistic perspective on scientific inference, then just uh, uncertainty or even just statistical uncertainty, maybe we uncover other problems that are currently uh, ignored. And I also hope that this kind of analysis provides perspective to pursue um, uh, such lines of research. Now, a last take home, of course, I said it already before, is that I think the particular results, complexity theoretic results that are presented, show that science cannot be automated, and I think also should not be automated. Namely that plural, pluralism in approaches, in inferential approaches, and some indeterminacy, so that it's not all codified, is, in my opinion, vital for discovery. And I think that these results also uh, substantiate such a, such a claim. And the reason for this is that, in a sense, that the explanation that we are looking for as a cognitive scientist is not just a needle in a haystack. It is, in fact, a needle in a landscape of haystacks. And if we are trying to make inferences, scientific inferences, based on a particular procedure or a particular uh, uh, base of uh, set of rules or algorithm in general, we may be looking in one of these haystacks, not realizing that our needle is all the way over there in a completely different haystack, that our procedure doesn't even know how to look into that haystack. Yeah? So this is the main take home uh, that I want to convey. And with this, I close. Uh, just to mention that if you're interested in reading more uh, about this work, uh, also uh, the supplementary materials, if you want to dig into the, some of the proof arguments, uh, you can check out uh, the paper. And I also want to uh, very much thank my uh, wonderful collaborators again, uh, Patricia Rich, Todd Worm, and uh, Ronald de Haan. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to the discussion.